Hi, good evening to all of you. It is so good to be here to see uh, familiar and also unfamiliar faces. That um, And thank you, uh, Linda, for your warm um, welcome. And it's good to... This is the first uh, collaboration that BGSD has uh, with GBN. So it's a privilege and I look forward to more collaboration with yourself going forward. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with BGSD, and if it's a whole mouthful, just remember boys and girls study together. And uh, you should be fine. Okay, now so when we started off this collaboration, we decided, we both thought about, okay, let's focus on the purpose of work after the pandemic. But how do you curate that? So what we decided to do, and I will do the theological bit, by providing some framework and perspectives about this subject, and then the real exciting part, the case study will be Li Min taking up and talking about it from the hospitality sector point of view. And I think how this program will run is that once we have done that, then we'll turn the questions over to you. What about your industry? Where are you from? Now that the pandemic is sort of over, we have new disruptions, what is your challenges? And I, what we hope to do is to curate some of your insights and inputs and hopefully this will fit into our programs uh, they will develop and curate for you in the future. So, um, so basically, it is um, we are going to reflect on God's purposes for us uh, at work, but yet at the same time, uh, what does it look like in our disruptive age? Now, before we begin, let me just commit our time to God in prayer, just a short prayer for, to our Lord Jesus. Our dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for being born on earth 2,000 years ago, to live, to die, to rise again for our sake. Thank you for your life where you demonstrated the fruitfulness of work. When you work with your parents, when you train as a carpenter, when you taught, healed and comforted as a rabbi. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that we can follow your footsteps now to participate in your transformation of the world by living out our work in faithfulness. So lead us now as we consider how to bear fruit in you, and in your name we pray. Amen. Now, last month, uh, I was travelling in Vienna, and so many of you know Vienna is the musical capital of Europe. And when you are there, you end up listening to too much Mozart, and I became curious. I was I want to find out more that what do musicians do? You know, this is the kind of place where... Um, is instead of people basking with guitars, right? They were singing Italian arias as basking, you know, top-notch uh, uh, La Traviata kind of uh, arias. And so I really got interested in trying to find out what do they actually do? So I, well, I first checked Google. And um, so basically, I stumbled upon this lady called Lisa Batiashvili. I hope I got her name correct. She's a Georgian violinist. Now, as a concert violinist, Lisa had a very hectic schedule. She would have to fly to different cities to perform with different orchestras. Now, one day is London, another day it is New York, and the third day nowadays they come to Singapore. So you can hardly imagine she hardly had a lot of time with her family unless they were willing to fly with her all over the world. And then in 2020, everything came to a halt well, for all of us, right? So with the pandemic, with the lockdown, all her projects came to a halt, her concerts came to a halt, she had a charity event that was basically uh, postponed indefinite, um, indefinitely. Now, the, and so she, she reflected on this, and basically you felt that actually not all is bad. Well, on the one hand, she lamented, as per many musicians, that um, concerts were cancelled, you know, um, it's just a shame. And, but on the other hand, she's now thankful for having more time, much more time in lockdown with her husband and two children. So in short, the pandemic gave her a lot of time to think about her lives. What is her priorities? What should she focus on in the future? Now, most of us are not performing artists. Any, any musicians, no uh, actors here? No, huh? okay. Not yet, huh? maybe. Now, so... Unfortunately, also for us, our disruptions haven't, um, haven't stopped. So we now have the war in Ukraine, we have soaring inflation, we have looming uh, recession, but also you know, the tension between US and China. And it's all very real, right? Uh, Micron was shut down by China, basically. And I turned to friends who work in the Micron plant, mostly supporting China. 
what's going to happen to them is, is really a big disruption. So all these things can turn against us. There's more stress, business losses, retrenchments, and so on. So it also forces us to ask questions like this. All this work that we have done, okay, what is the meaning? What's the value of this work? Is this worthwhile to continue? Especially when we go through so much stress, you know, um, sometimes a toxic environment and so on. And then if you are a Christian, you will start asking them, what does our role play in this? You know, beyond just, uh, you no know, friends say, I pray for you, you know. But what does our role, um, that, does our faith do? So what I want to do is just to provide a few, uh, a few frameworks and perspectives that I myself have found helpful to thinking through these questions. Now, the first framework that I'm going to go through is basically this one, which is the iceberg model of behavior. And most of you are familiar with this. Let me just go through this very briefly. Uh, basically, the assumption is this, that 10% of the iceberg, the tip is above the water, the rest is unseen, 90% underneath the water, submerged. And, and uh, the analogy is basically, most of what we behave, what is seen, is that tip of the iceberg, okay? Uh, it's visible to us, it's visible to everyone else. But what sustains that tip, what informs that tip, what is, is basically what's unseen in us, that 90%. And those are our values and ethics. And this, and, and this 90% is what we deem as good. But these values and ethics in turn are then informed by our beliefs, our philosophy of life. And for Christians, it would be teachings from the Bible and what we call theology. But things also get a bit complicated because the same behavior or work practice may be motivated by very different values and beliefs. So for example, I may work hard because I feel insecure. I want to earn more money. I want to prove to my mother I'm better than my brother. It can happen in that way. Or I can work very hard because I believe that God has called me to this job and I want to steward my life well. So you see two phenomena, but what underlies that phenomena can be very, very different. Okay, so that's the first complexity. The second complexity is that our behavior can contradict our professed values and beliefs. And we are all familiar with this, right? We see people, ourselves sometimes, claim that we are Christians, we are supposed to love God and our neighbor, right? Our neighbor. And, but yet at work, we may start scolding people, we may backstab people, we criticize people, we go for lunchtime Bible study, then you go to office, what happens? You start scolding people, right? So you become this very toxic person that everybody avoids. Which means that your professed beliefs and your behavior mismatch. Or maybe actually your behavior shows that what you think you believe in is actually not true. Which is why I think our reflection, okay, this don't always open. Okay, our reflection on what informs and guides our work practices is also and always an exercise in developing self-awareness and leadership. It is a journey of discerning what we really value, what we really believe in, and to attempt to align those things so that we do not contradict ourselves. So in any case, you can see that if we are to sort out this tip of the iceberg, you know, what do we do? How should we work? We need to evaluate our values and beliefs, the, what's submerged inside us, and ensure that they're aligned so that we are not chasing after the wrong goals. Now, where do we start? Okay. Now, so nowadays it's very common for people to say that we humans are merely products of chance. We evolve millions of years, we end up where we are, but we are still frail, mortal creatures. You hear that all the time, particularly if you just look at documentaries. And scientists will say, you know what, we are all stuck in this vast, big universe that's meaningless. And soon we will die, soon we will be forgotten. And if you subscribe to that, then many of us will then say our work is not very meaningful, right? Um, but then many also say, you know, especially you know, in executive training, they will say that, well, your work is meaningful. You are meant to flourish at work. Well, what does that mean? They will say things like, well, um, sometimes uh, in a motivation talk, they will talk about your work is meant to maximize your riches or to realize your talents or to help others or just to enjoy our creativity. 
And there are times, sometimes, we will ask deep in our hearts whether all this is true or not. No? Am I just imposing meaning on something when there's actually no meaning at all? I'm fooling myself. So if you talk to your Gen Z kids and so on, they will say all oh, this is social construction, right? You're just fooling yourself. But is it really true? But yet, on other days, on other days, we find that this pursuit of human flourishing at work is actually quite compelling. There are many kinds of work that really do feel good and valuable. They don't seem fleeting and meaningless, such as the caring and healing we give to our patients. Or if you're a banker, you give a loan and you actually help someone, a family, to, to buy a house where they can build their home in. Or you uh, create a piece of artwork that everybody enjoys. You know, if you are creators of Gardens by the Bay, you must be delighted that people say, hey, this is very nice, you know, I enjoy it. Just don't charge so high, that's all. Now, for Christians, we believe there's a reason for this instinct, a reason to believe that this gut feeling is correct. And that's to be found in our origin story. You know, Christians also have one, not only Marvel. Um, so Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, we have God saying, let us make man in our image after our likeness. They will have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the heavens, livestock, and everything creeping thing. So basically for Christians, the simple but compelling reason is that we are made in the image of God. And just as God, our Creator, is good, loving, and creative, so do we value and imitate His goodness, love, and creativity as His images. Simple as that. This is why we value all the beauty and goodness and love we see. That don't seem to be a clear reason. But the simple reason that the Scriptures tells us is that we are made in God's image. That's why we appreciate such things. Now, what's more is this. In ancient times, statues are placed in temples and cities to represent the presence of deities or emperors in those cities. So if you attack those statues, you're attacking the deity or the empress. So likewise, we human beings are basically images of God placed on this temple called Earth to represent God's rule and care for this world. Now, once you see things from this perspective, we are placed here by God to govern, to represent God in this world. There are at least two implications to this philosophy of life. Firstly, everyone is made in God's image. Everyone, you look at each other, turn around, don't look at each other, don't look at your phones, look at each other. And remember, every one of you is significant. No one is insignificant, no. Whether you are healthy, disabled, whether you are blue-collar, white-collar, rich or poor, each one of you is destined. You have the responsibility of representing God's likeness to one another, not just to your bosses, to one another. Okay? And when our friends, our families, our colleagues, they look at you, they want to... That's the potential of seeing the image of God in you. It's wonderful, isn't it? No, just take a few moments, turn around, don't paise, no, look at each other. And remember, when you look at this person, it's not just a person, it's an image of God. And they look at you, uh, and how you behave also reflects or don't reflect God's image. It's very humbling and awesome, is it not? But let's move on to my second point. Okay, next slide. Okay. Now, the way, there's another way we, important way we image or represent God's presence. And that's through how we work. You see, God is a creative work, right? In Genesis chapter 1, He says, let there be, and He created the whole universe. And when He created the first couple, Adam and Eve, He placed them in the garden, not just to chill and relax, but they were told to tend and to cultivate the garden, to work. So, as the bearers of God image, therefore, and as the descendants of Adam and Eve, we are told to create, to in the work of creation and working, we reflect God's goodness to us. So work is not a curse. Okay, I know that some Christian quarters even talk about work as a curse. It is not a curse. It is designed into our DNA. So to put it differently, just imagine this with me. When you type your emails, when you... If you are cleaner, you clean the rooms. When you plan your production schedules for the plant, when you have meetings with your colleagues, 
all these are actually opportunities to manifest God's goodness. So when you do that as a human being, you in a special way can demonstrate that. You can, you can do it very sian way, right? You can do that. We all have done that. But if you see that you can do that as a reflection of God's glory, it's very different. So in, in short, I believe that our work is, if you look at this next slide, our work is sacred. But only if you take your uh, destiny seriously as an image of God. And Lee me later will share with us what does this mean uh, for the hospitality sector. But let me just move on to do a reality check. And that is the fact that we know that what I often say, very nice, but not true, right? Some of us are caught in a situation, I've been there, where we don't want to go to work because there are toxic people at work, right? We sometimes find our work, you know, uh, write so many policy papers, if our civil servants, not very meaningful, right? Because after that, it's archived, nobody reads that anymore. Uh, civil servant, huh? <laughs> Understand, huh? And you thought that your workplace is a place for cordial relationships, but it's toxic all the time. You know, people playing politics, they quarrel with each other. And then compensation doesn't seem to be fair. No company business decline. You have some bosses come out in the newspaper. I claim responsibility, I retrench them. A bit strange, no? Uh, you get that all the tech companies doing that. And sometimes, if you are nurses, social workers and so on, you feel that your, your work, your compensation don't befit all the sacrifices that you make. Now, all this back to the question, why has it turned out so like that? Huh? Um, why is there so much creativity, potential for creativity and goodness? It ends up ending killing our souls. So this brings me to my second point. This was press very carefully, is it? Ah. Okay, why is it so like that? And again, you go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, we are familiar. Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God. But I want to, we often see this on a personal level, you know, sin perpetuates in us perpetually, uh, personally. But you also need to understand that there is a fracture and gradual deterioration of relationships in all fronts between God and humanity, men and women, friends and families, us and the rest of creation. So in other words, the disobedience of uh, humanity triggered a systemic disruption. It ripples through all creation. It cannot be fixed or healed. Now, Adam can regret, he can repent, but it's not going to fix that. It is like a driver in his drunkenness. He hits someone, kills the father, and leaves the children orphans. Now, when he sobers up, he may regret, he apologizes, he ends up in jail, but all this cannot heal the damage to the family, is it not? You have triggered something that you cannot pick up the mess. Okay? So, a kind of systemic disruption has happened with our sin. And this is not hypothetical, if you think about it. In the 21st century, we see that in climate change. So, Western countries, since the 19th century Industrial Revolution, use a lot of fossil fuels, and they became very rich. But they cannot imagine the kind of destruction they did to their planet. And now, try as they may, they can't stop that. And, but what's the uh, most unfair thing is that the people who struggle most are the island nations. Those didn't benefit from a single cent of the Western economies, but in the next 20, 30 years, they will see their islands being submerged, swallowed up by rising sea levels. So if that's the case, how do we navigate a world that is at once beautiful and ugly? So this brings us to my third and final point. This brings back to us back to the gospel. Sometimes we think gospel is just a saving, saving me, uh, Christ forgive my sins and so on. Yes, that's true. But it's, there's a systemic impact also. So we are made in God's image. We are destined to reflect His goodness. But we are caught up in a broken world. But Christ comes. God didn't leave us um, in this world alone. So if you come through the Bible, yeah, then he clicks at the back, right? Uh, if you come through the Bible, um, you always have this picture, a very nice picture, Old Testament, God wooing and disciplining his people, trying to heal them as they come. But then 2,000 years ago, something happens. Jesus comes, he teaches, he heals, um, but people hate him too much, so much that they nailed him to the cross. 
And those of you who are not familiar with the life of Jesus, flip to the middle of the Bible, New Testament, read the Gospels, and you find out more. And you find out that this Jesus is a good, loving, and wise man, and definitely not dis- deserving of the suffering and death on the cross. But most, what's most remarkable is three days later, he rose from the dead, and we believe as Christians, it demonstrates that he has the power over death, he has the power to transform lives, and he will give that power to us. And he speaks of the, and one of the disciples speaks of that power in this way, that the word of God became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory um, as the one coming from the Father, God the Father. And so he then, in his resurrection, he empowers us by his spirit, and by that spirit, therefore, we have the ability to transform lives. Okay? Which means it overcomes our pride, our greed, our insecurities, our selfishness. It brings healing to all the hurts. Sometimes we've got parent, father, mother issues. You know, if a lot of our leadership underlying that dig deep, deep is all father, mother issues. Instead, we become humble, generous, loving, trusting God. But this will happen over time, not instant. Okay? Um, it's a slow boy situation. And requires us to collaborate with the Spirit so that He will change the way we work, change the way we interact with our colleagues, change the way we forge our policies, our business models, but if only uh, we allow Him to do so. So what does this mean for us, practically speaking? Now, for those of us who are unfamiliar with the message of Jesus Christ, you can ask your friends and invite you um, to to find out more, because once you know Jesus and what he's trying to do in transforming this world, um, you will have the ability to better understand what's the meaning of our work, where are we here, why are we being created. And ultimately, if you don't sort out all these internal things, it's very hard to lead ourselves and therefore lead others, let alone lead another organisation. Now, for those of us who are Christians and we think that our work is mundane, we, we wonder what's all this work all about. I think the invitation is to remember you are made in the image of God. You are placed in the particular workplace by God. You are there to reflect God in the way you interact with people, in the way that you do your work. Your work is sacred there. No, your, 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 your hospitality work or your whatsoever work that you do in the workplace is, is equally important as what you do in church. No, I've met people who say, I, I, I'm a very hospitable person. But I think when I show hospitality in church, I am holier than when I show it in the workforce. Then it's a bit schizophrenic. Lah. No, I just So you reflect God's glory there. Now finally, for those of us who are caught up in the difficulties of work, retrenchment can be real, toxic colleagues can be real. Um, sometimes we're not performing well because there's a misfit of job. Just remember, God is present. He will be there to guide us. He's not this abstract God that you hear in sermons. No, He's real. He is with us. He is with us with the spirits, through the counsel of friends. And the invitation is not to despair, but to discern God's guidance. He really serious about guiding you. you know, just remember, remember the story of the prodigal son. Like prodigal son turned back, heaven say sorry, the father runs to him. And the father is God. So if that story is true, then God is there to help us. We need to have the confidence that that's the case. Thank you.